Uh, they will be more than happy to hand out a Bible if you do not have one. And as they do, please turn, to your, turn in your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 1. And as you're turning, I would like to take a moment. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier today, um, but Dave and Lana Esty, as I want to share a little bit, this will be the first time after today, I realized a couple of weeks ago, that this will be the first time that I will stand on a stage in a church since I was almost 15, that Lana and Dave will not be in that church. And so um, I will miss them greatly. They, Dave has been a, a mentor to me in many ways. In fact, when I was uh, seeking guidance in choosing the church in Illinois, I spoke to Dave and uh, sought his input on that. In fact, there were moments while I was in Illinois that I called him. So I'm going to find your phone number when you're in Lynchburg. And I'm sure that you will hear from me again at some point. And I do look, like Steve said, I do look forward to one day where we stand together before the throne of God and worship once again together, if not sooner. So thank you so much to both of you, and uh, you will be incredibly missed. Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1 starts with a very interesting story. Nehemiah was not a prophet. He was not a high priest. He was not a, anyone real significant within the, the people of Israel. In fact, he was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes, the people that had conquered the Israelites. However, as the time had gone on, as their captivity had gone on, the Israelites were beginning to be allowed to go back to their homeland, as so often happens, not just to let them free, but to allow them to spread the empire that they were under. And as they arrived, as the remnant who were allowed to go back to, to Israel and to Jerusalem, as they arrived in the city, they discovered something, and that was the walls had, had been destroyed. They had been neglected, and through time... They no longer stood. And we hear a lot about walls today. We hear it all the time from, from various and sundry politicians. We hear some of them say we want to build a 30 to 40 foot wall. And some of them say we don't need walls because they divide us. But back then, walls had a very different significance to the people. And as we'll see as we open up, we'll realize that walls, they were built with brick and mortar... They surrounded the city, and the gates that, it, that were in the midst of this wall acted as guard posts. They would see either friendly people coming or invaders coming, and they could warn the city of the impending invaders. Also, at these gates, city leaders would meet to discuss various things. In fact, if you've ever seen Fiddler on the Roof and you've seen all the elders of the city coming together and they would talk about the spiritual things, it's probably much like that. But not only that, but they also dealt with civil issues and they placed judgments at the city gates. So when these things were destroyed, it caused havoc within the city because the walls would either bring glory or reproach to a city depending on how they were and how they looked. So Nehemiah heard the news, and in chapter 1, as P Pastor Steve was talking about, we hear he says this. In verse 4, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open and hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, and now day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded, your servant Moses." Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments, and do them though, th through those of you who have been scattered, were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them 
from there and I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to be dwelt. They are your servant and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servants successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray so much that as we open up your word, Father God, that you give me the words that you want, to, want me to say, that you give me the ideas and the truths that you wish me to express so that I am not glorified, but you and you alone are glorified and you receive honor, all the honor and praise today. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. We see in Nehemiah that he heard and saw the need in chapter 1. He saw the need that there was, that the walls had collapsed, as I said, and that there was a need for the walls to be rebuilt. So he started to pray, and he goes to the king, and he says, look, the walls are down. We need to do something about this. This isn't good for us. And the king says, okay. And it was an answer to prayer, and he allowed Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem to not only inspect the walls, but if need be, to repair them. So in chapter 2, we see the fact that he's going to, to Jerusalem, and in fact, he goes by night and starts to inspect the walls. And as he goes to one gate to the next gate and sees the wall after wall, he realizes not only are they destroyed, but they're gone. To the point that those, those people surrounding the city of Jerusalem have now started to mock this city. As I heard this story as a child, I pictured this one thing, that Nehemiah was this great contractor. And that he got a big crew together, and he started at one part of the wall and just continued all the way around and built. And I pictured that he had his crew, and he just started. He was like Jim Williams, who knows how to do things around the church, and he just has his crew, and they just go around and do stuff that needs to be done. And that's the way I pictured Nehemiah. However... As you read chapter 3, you realize this one thing. Nehemiah was not the one that rebuilt the wall. He showed the need, and he saw the need, and then different people, different sects, different, different high priests, all began to build the wall. So many times we as Christians think when there's a problem, we need to do it all ourselves, and we, realize, we forget that God placed us in a family for a reason. He placed us in a family so that they might lift us up when we fall and we might do the same when others fall. So Nehemiah had the opportunity now to rebuild the walls. As I read the scripture, I started doing a little, I started looking around me. And I realized something. That we have a problem within the church of God. And in some churches, worse than others, and in some individuals, including myself, we need to start looking into ourselves. And the problem is this. Our spiritual walls have begun to crumble around us. I was talking to some friends not long ago. I was talking to my wife and a couple friends. And as I spoke to them, I realized this one thing. That among our friends and people with not just this church but other churches, there are families who when we see them in public, we say to ourselves, that's a family that I want to be like. That's a family that has it all together. And yet when you start speaking to them in private and you start examining their private lives, you realize there's a problem. Because there are men of God, there are quote unquote men of God who have issues. I've seen time and time again where people have gotten divorced and the, the overriding problem is men who've forgotten what it means to be a man of God in, the, in their home. We've gotten a skewed idea of what it means to be a man in today's society. We are either taught that we are supposed to be weak and understanding or we are supposed to be the dictator in a home. 
And that was never God's intent. I've heard time and time again through different families where husbands abuse their wives and yet they'll stand on a stage and speak and share. Or they'll be a leader in the church and yet in their homes they are far from a leader. So we need to re start rebuilding our walls. I look on Facebook. And I'll be honest with you, I'm one of those guys, I'm on Facebook, I'm a Facebook stalker. I don't exactly know what that means, but people have told me that I'm a Facebook stalker. However, I do know what some people eat today. I will know that they got a brand new pair of shoes, and pretty much you will know exactly what I feel about political things, because I am very outspoken. But I see on Facebook, and I've told the teens this, I see certain things with, within language and actions that speak volumes of where we stand when it comes to our foundation in Jesus Christ. I see too many times where fellow Christians will post online and they'll post something that's really amazing and these three letters come up, OMG. And in some cases, even worse. As a Christian, these words should never come out of our mouth, much less be typed on a screen. It's our foundation that is crumbling beneath our feet sometimes, at times. So what are our spiritual walls? Like I said, it's our spiritual foundation. It is that thing that we rely on the most. The stronger our foundation, the stronger the walls that protect us. But just like Nehemiah, we are asked time and time again from pulpits all around the country, we are asked to inspect our walls or our foundation. And like it says in James 1, it says, many of you are like a hearer of the word but not a doer, and if you were a doer, you are like a man who looks in the glass plainly, sees what he looks like and leaves, and forgets what manner of man he was. Now, some of you, at first I didn't really understand this until one day my youth pastor explained it to me. Now, this is true for a lot of guys. For some guys, as I'm learning since I've gotten a haircut, this isn't all, all the time an option. But sometimes, we have to be to work at 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, if you know that you work in Washington, D.C. area, you've got to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning, unless you live two miles from work, it's going to take you an hour to get to work. We get up at 7.25. Guys will run in, we'll take a real quick shower, which really isn't a shower, it's more of a spritz. Because if, if soap touches us, we're lucky. And where the soap touches us, it's probably just, if you have hair, sorry Brad, it, it's our hair and we just sort of let it just cascade down. We jump out of the shower, we get dressed, and we look in the mirror and we say, we look good and we leave. Now, here's the issue I have learned. If I can get out before my wife's wake, I'm golden. However, my wife will go, really? Seriously? Is that what you're wearing? Is that how you're going to look? <laughs> and automatically I just go, no, I'm just practicing. <laughs> so many times we examine the foundation of our faith, and we see it, and we go, it's pretty good, and we leave. And God is saying, really? Seriously? This is the way you're going to leave this? Nehemiah had an option. When he saw the walls, he could have said, it's not too bad. We've been conquered. We're pretty good. In all things being, being said and done, it's not really that bad. But as you see in Nehemiah, now let me encourage you, especially mothers and fathers, as you get an opportunity this week for devotion, take time to read through Nehemiah and see the incredible story of this cupbearer with your family. But we realize that there is a problem with the spiritual foundation many times. And here's the problem. Is that they need to be rebuilt. And let me tell you what happens when we start to rebuild the walls, rebuild our foundation. Here's what happened. Number one. Walls will provide protection from outside forces and an open invitation to friendly ideas. The world will tell us 
As time changes, so do our ideas of who God is and the interpretation of Scripture. The problem with this is, this is a falsehood. Because God does not change. Contrary to popular belief, as we evolve, quote-unquote, as human beings, God does not need to evolve because he's already arrived. Scripture says he was the same, he is, and he will be forevermore. Not only that, but there is just one interpretation of what Scripture is. It is not an opinion. It is not my interpretation. It is God's opinion, it, God's interpretation. And I always use this example. When William Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, he had one meaning for this story. A lot of people can have their opinions on what that meaning was, but ultimately the writer had a, the interpretation. Throughout time, we have used our thoughts and our, our ideas to put our interpretation of what Scripture says, but make no mistakes, there is but one interpretation of what Scripture is. And the problem is this, is that as a person who stands behind the pulpit and sh gives the Word of God, when their interpretation of Scripture is foggy, there is a mist in the congregation, according to Tony Evans. He says this. He goes on to say, Theology must rule anthropology, sociology, and all other ologies. It must not be the other way around. Our history, our knowledge, our environment must not dictate how we believe and what we believe to be true in Scripture. In fact, when we bring God into the mix, it, it must have two elements, spirit and truth. Spirit must operate out of love, out of caring. How true is this? When we're talking to those who are unsaved, sometimes we get very judgmental. And, it's, and a lot of times, it's, in fact, it's thrown back into our faces. I'm reminded of the church in Nebraska who goes out at, at funerals. They are filled with hate. Their message is probably correct, but their, their methodology lacks the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ. Everything we do, everything we say, all of our actions must be dictated first by love. Secondly, though, and this is the most important thing, it must have truth. And truth must operate on an objective standard. The problem, we are operating on a standard that is rooted in culture, that is rooted in history, that is rooted in background, and today's day and age, it is rooted in intellectual thought. The objective standard by which truth must be measured is God's point of view and no other. And the problem is, is that as people, we, have no, we ha cannot help it, but we reach back into our history, our culture, our background, and our knowledge to legitimize our decisions today when the decisions today go against the kingdom of God and God himself. And let me give you a couple examples. Science tells us when it comes to same-sex relationships or marriage, that those people were born that way. Now please understand this, I am not a scientist. I don't play one on TV. I don't even pretend to be as smart as a scientist. So let's just say for the sake of argument that these people were born this way. Scripture said, Paul says this throughout his writings, he says this, just because I was born a certain way doesn't mean that that's the way I want to be. He says in Romans, the things that I do, I don't want to do, and the things that I do want to do, I don't do. He goes on to say, the old man is to be crucified and the new man is to be glorified. Just because you were born a certain way doesn't mean that you need to advance that think thinking. Because we are a fallen creature 
Back in the day in the garden when Adam and Eve took of the fruit, we inherited what they did wrong. And understand this, you may have been born this way, this is the way you may be, but this is not the way you were meant to be in God's eyes. I can say many times, I have a problem with anger. You can ask my wife. I hate traffic. I hate traffic with a passion. I will drive four hours out of the way just so I don't have to stop for bumper-to-bumper traffic. We were coming up to Lynchburg from Illinois one day, and we were going through uh, Charlotte, West Virginia, wherever, and there was a whole lot of traffic. I mean, it was bumper-to-bumper because of a three-foot piece of land being worked on. I was mad. I will tell you the truth that I'm glad nobody in this building was there because I was not a happy man. I was ranting and raving about what was going on. I could have said, well, that's how I am. That's how I was born. Unfortunately, the song that came on while I was ranting and raving, don't worry, be happy. And my wife, in all of her infinite wisdom, just sat there and looked over at me and smiled. (laughs) I could say, you know, that's who I am. That's the way I was born. That may be true, but that's not the way God intended me to be. Truth must be grounded in an objective standard. One other example... The world says this, all religions are fundamentally the same and at best superficially false. Ravi Zacharias says that's wrong, just plain wrong. Just because people have said this, not just because your father said it, just because your grandfather said it, just because your great-grandfather said it, they're wrong. All religions are fundamentally different and at best superficially the same. And, we are, and when we are looking at religions of the world, we must ask ourselves four questions, and they must be answered in two ways. We must answer these four questions, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And when we look at religions, they must be judged, must be answered these two ways. Correspondence to truth by either empirical measurement or logical reasoning process. And second, they must cohere to one another. Christianity is the only religion that can answer all four questions using those two objectives. And let me show you why. We say that Jesus Christ died on a cross and he rose again on the third day. We believe that to be historically true because witness after witness, whether it be Christian or non-Christian, has said that there was a man called Jesus. He did walk this earth for 33 years, and upon those 33 years, he died on a cross. He was crucified. And thousands of people can say that three days later, he rose from the dead. That corresponds with a logical measurement. It is the foundation of what we believe. Islam says Jesus existed, but he was never crucified. The problem with this is he can't be proven. You can't say that because it's already been proven that there was a man named Jesus, and he did die, and he was crucified. And according to to witnesses, eyewitness accounts, he did arise three days later. So that, in the very sense, says that Islam is wrong. There has to be truth, and truth must be that driving engine that drives everything about who we are. When our walls are built properly, not only does it expose us to the truth, but it allows us to see God for the greatness of who he is. And let 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 me tell you what I mean by this. Louis Giglio says that because of the onset of sin, because of sin that has come into our lives, because of who we are, Our measurement of God has shrunk while our estimation of who we are has expanded. I told this to the teens not long ago. I said, we worship a great God. And sometimes we lose track of just how great this God is. Isaiah chapter 40 says this.
He has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weight, the mountains in balance. When it talks about he measures the stars with his hands by the span, it means from his thumb to his pinky. And you say, well, okay, he's a big God. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked that question. Let's just say this golf ball is the earth. I'm going to take a minute, let you all find yourselves. Now, we know that the sun is a pretty big star because it is the star in our galaxy, in our, in our solar system. And it's pretty big, but we really, let's just examine how big it is. If the earth was the size of a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. That's pretty big, isn't it? However, the sun is not the biggest star in the galaxy. It is just one of hundreds of billions of stars in our, in our universe, and it is, not, it is by far not the largest. There is another star by the name of Betelgeuse. I just like the name because of the movie from the 80s. The size of that star is twice the size of, and I know what you're about to say, the sun. No, it is twice the size of the orbit of the earth around the sun. If the earth was a golf ball, the size of that star would be the size, would be comparing it to the size of the Empire State Buildings times six. Now, I know you don't understand that, but here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to take a trip up to New York City. You and your family, you're going to have to go downtown, find the Empire State Building, place the golf ball on the ground. Don't worry about it. No one will look at you weird. They probably won't even notice you. Then you are going to have to go across the street, look up, imagine five more Empire State Buildings on top of the one that you're looking at, and that is the size of the earth compared to that star. And God holds, measures the stars and the galaxies in the universe by the span of his hand. We serve a mighty God. And we have the nerve sometimes to say, I know it's best for me. I can interpret scripture, and scripture that you have given me will change according to my time in my sociology, in my education. We have a lot of nerves sometimes, don't we? Walls provide a sense of family and unity. When our walls or our foundation is proper, when it has a proper foundation, our focus be take is, is off of ourselves, and our focus becomes on those things that are important to God. The idea of denomination of different sects within Christianity become, come minimal, become minimal compared to, to our ultimate focus, and that is on the God of the universe, the creator of all. When we have a proper foundation, when we see God in who he is supposed to be, I don't know what I did, sorry. When we see God in how he is supposed to be, The issues of how a man is supposed to treat his wife become solved. The issues of race become solved. The issues of the world become negligible because Christians now are focusing on what is important, not as what, what is minor. Too many times we focus on the small things and not on the important things. When we focus on what is right and what is good, the world sees us for the way we're supposed to be. When our foundation is correct, when our walls are built, when we are being protected from the outside sources, the world sees us. Now, you'll see in Nehemiah as you read through, there are people out there 
that did not like what Nehemiah was doing as he was building the walls. There were people around the city that all of a sudden started to mock him. They went to the, the, the king of the empire and said, do you know what those people are doing? You need to stop that. When we start to build our walls, our spiritual walls, when we start to repair the foundation, the world's going to go, what are they doing? Do you know what they're doing over there? There's going to be a whole lot of accusations come at us. When we stand for what is right, the world will take notice. And yes, some of them are going to mock us and some of them are going to make fun of us. But some are going to take notice that there's a difference and that there's a love. And that the things we talk about and the things we believe, we really truly believe in. And they in turn want to know what we have. And finally, walls provide an identity. Remember what I said, one of the things about the walls, they provided either great re reproach or their, their popularity of the town is, is understood by these walls. And it's the same way with our, our faith. As our walls are built properly, as the foundation is placed, the world realizes who we are. They'll know what we believe. There will be no misunderstanding about what we believe. And in case you're wondering, this is what I believe. I believe there is one God in three people. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I believe that his word, the Bible, is the inspired word of God written through the years, all 66 books. They should be taken and must be taken as literal. From Genesis, the creation of six days, to the final day when it says he will rule for all eternity. These are a literal accounts, not things to be subject to whether it be myths. They are literal. When it says that he was born of a virgin, you can bet he was born of a virgin. When it says he turned water to wine, he turned water to wine. When it says that he walked on this earth for 33 years and at the end he was falsely accused, he died on a cross, a horrible death, because he loved us and cared for us. He died for our sins. And make no mistakes about it, this is not a falsehood, this is not a metaphor. He arose three days later. Literally. If you ever want to know what I believe, open this book, and you'll know exactly what I believe. I believe that life begins at conception and ends when God decides it's over. I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. There's no question about what I believe. I wear it on my sleeve. When our walls are correct, we have an identity. People will know what we believe. But how do we keep the walls from crumbling? Psalm 119 goes through one of the, long, the longest chapter in the Bible. Verse after verse after verse, it will tell you how does a man keep his ways pure? By following the statutes that he has set before us. Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not what? Sin against God. You want to know how we repair the foundation and the walls that have crumbled around us? It's getting into this word. I learned probably almost 10 years ago. I went, to, I went to a Christian university. I went to a Christian school. Grew up in a Christian home. I could tell you story after story after the Bible, book from book from book. However, the problem was I didn't really understand the interpretations many times. I didn't read them. I didn't know how to apply them. And it wasn't until a friend of mine showed me a program called Precepts Ministries. Precepts Ministries is an inductive Bible study that states this. According to Scripture, Scripture interprets Scripture. I don't need a man to tell me exactly what it means. I just need to read the Word of God, and it will tell me what it's saying. Remember what I said. Scripture was never meant to be foggy for the believer, only for the unbeliever. 
Scripture says that's, that it's a mystery to those that don't believe. But of those who believe, it should be clear as day because Scripture interprets Scripture. You want to know how to rebuild the wall? Get into the Word of God and see what it has to say. I've heard it said time and time again from Pastor Jim, even in self-confrontation, there is nothing that can't be solved apart from Scripture. It is said that we as Christians are afraid of science. There was a time when theology was considered the queen of science. Because apart from theology, there was no such thing as science. Apart from theology, apart from what was said in God's word, there was no psychology. Apart from scripture, there was no such thing as marriage counseling. Apart from scripture, there was no such thing as living right in society. Scripture is what we need to base our faith on. I want to leave you with this one story. His name was William Borden. William Borden was the son of the, of the family who started the Borden Dairy Company. Some of you may have heard this story. When William Borden was attending Yale University, William Borden had everything he could possibly want. One of the richest families in America. William Borden attended Yale University, and while he was there, he heard a sermon by R.A. Torrey, and he gave his life over to Christ. It was while he was there, he realized that he would no longer want to be a part of, the board, be part of that enterprise, but he believed that God was calling him to be a missionary to China. So in the front of his Bible, he wrote one thing, no reserves. Because he took everything that he had, all the wealth that he had, and he sold it. And he gave it to charity, and he gave it back to his family. From there, William Borden went to Princeton to train to be a missionary. It is said of him, from his fellow students, that William Borden did not want to be this great person. He didn't want to go in to be known as one of the Bordens. He just wanted to be a college student. But student after student, as they talked about William Borden, they said this one thing. There was something different about William. He didn't wear his faith on his sleeve. He didn't walk around with a Schofield Bible, if it was in existence back then. He just lived what he believed. It is said that he started a Bible study in a prayer group with one other person. Four years later, 1,500 students were meeting on a weekly basis based on that Bible study. So William Borden, at the time, his father passes away while he's out in Princeton. The family comes to him and says, William, you are the heir to this company. You need to come back. You have the know-how to make this company succeed beyond what your father had done. It is your duty as a Borden to come back. And War William Borden said, nope, God's called me to be a missionary. And he wrote in the front of his Bible, no retreats. William Borden graduated from Princeton. On his way to China, he stopped in, in Egypt to study about the religion of, of Islam, to better know how to reach those people that he was going to in China. However, the problem arose while he was in Egypt. He contracted a disease and died. If the story had simply ended there, you would say to yourself, what a waste of a life. He was a guy who had everything. He was given every opportunity. He had the riches of the world. He had everything he could possibly want, and he gave it all away for what? He failed. He ceased to go to where God had called him to go. He failed. But the story doesn't stop there. The story is told that his family comes to collect his belongings. And when they find his Bible on his nightstand, in the cover he finds these words, no reserves, no retreat, and finally just before his death he writes, no regrets. When our foundation and our walls are built properly, we can stand before our Heavenly Father one day when we come to an end of this very short life here on earth. 
and we can say, no regrets. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to share. But Father God, I pray right now for people in, this, in the room right here that if they don't have an idea of who Jesus Christ is, that today they would come to realize that Jesus Christ is the Savior of this world. Not only was he the creator, but he is the Savior of this world, and he seeks to have a relationship with them, Lord. And I just pray so much before they leave that they would seek someone out and talk to them what it means to have a relationship with the God of all creation. Father God, I just pray for myself and everyone in this building and in churches around the world, Lord, that we realize it's time to rebuild the walls. It's time to take a stand and be the man and the woman that you've called us to be. And while it may seem extraordinary, Lord, it's not extraordinary. It's just the way things are supposed to be. Father God, I just pray so much that as we go forward, that we realize that you put us here to bring you honor and you glory, that you might be lifted high. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.